Hi, welcome to Elephant in the Room. These are short adventures in geography designed to make you think. The idea is, wherever you see this red stamp, I want you to stop and think about what we're doing. Today, we're going to look at an idea that in a way goes right to the heart of geography, perhaps even deeper, as we'll see. It's called the Gaia Hypothesis, and it's about the relationship between living things and the environments they live in. Gaia, where the word geo comes from, by the way, is the ancient Greek earth goddess. And the Gaia Hypothesis is based on the idea that living things don't just respond to their environments, they affect those environments as well. That life is a great big part of how environments on Earth work. In the Gaia Hypothesis, this influence of living things on their environment is so profound that important parts of the chemical and physical environment come to reflect all the complicated living processes happening in it. And this happens not just at a micro scale or locally in things like soils or ponds, or even at the scale of ecosystems like tropical rainforests and great big bits of ocean, but globally as well at the scale of the whole planet. So, for example, Earth's atmosphere is extremely odd by planetary standards. It has lots of oxygen and just a little bit of carbon dioxide in it, and this is entirely due to living processes. Photosynthesis consumes carbon dioxide, producing biomass and releasing the oxygen and respiration breaks that biomass back down again, using up the oxygen and producing carbon dioxide. Neither of these gases hangs around in the atmosphere for very long, but both have important effects on virtually everything happening on Earth. Oxygen is very reactive stuff. If it gets too high, biological and environmental chemistry goes all skew and things start catching fire all over the place, which of course consumes lots of oxygen. On the other hand, if it gets too low, respiration doesn't work as efficiently, and then oxygen from photosynthesis can start to build back up again. Similarly, when carbon dioxide gets too low, it limits photosynthesis, so the carbon dioxide from respiration can start to build back up. But if it gets too high, temperatures start creeping up via the greenhouse effect. So over long and short periods of time, living processes determine the composition of the atmosphere and the composition of the atmosphere affects those living processes. So it's a loop, isn't it? a self-regulating cycle, sometimes called a negative feedback loop. And this loop keeps the composition of the atmosphere within certain limits. It's like homeostasis in biology, like when you get too hot, you sweat, and that cools you back down again, and then you stop sweating and can start warming up again. So your body temperature stays fairly constant. And it's not just Earth's atmosphere that works like this. It's the water cycle and surface temperature and local climates and uh, geology and ocean chemistry and the supply of nutrients, uh, the ecology and biology, of course, even physical things like geomorphology, maybe even great big stuff like plate tectonics. As far as the Gaia hypothesis is concerned, all these complicated interacting feedback mechanisms keep environments habitable for the life occurring in them. That environments are actively maintained in the right state for life by all that life getting on with the things it does. And the result of all this 
is that the individual ecosystems and species and so on are a bit like the various specialized organs of the Earth's complicated body, all dependent on each other and cooperating at some basic level and uh, keeping life possible. And the planet, the whole system, is behaving as though it were one gigantic living thing, dissipating in its uh, own very particular way the enormous waterfall of energy arriving from the sun. And that, in a nutshell, is the Gaia hypothesis. Now, we're quite familiar with this sort of idea these days, but when the Gaia hypothesis was first published in the 1970s, it was not greeted particularly favorably by scientists. It all seemed a bit, well, off with the fairies, I suppose. It didn't really fit the perceived wisdom that living things are all about competing for scarce resources and adapting to their surroundings. It seemed to imply that Earth was more than just a super efficient way to disperse lots of energy. It must have some kind of uh, intention to survive, maybe. The Gaia hypothesis takes a slightly broader look at life. It's more about cooperation and living and non-living systems co-evolving in complicated webs and adapting conditions to suit themselves. So you can see why some people uh, strongly committed to evolutionary theory might have a problem with this idea. It makes accounting for life just in terms of natural selection and stuff like DNA a bit more difficult. So the guy who came up with the hypothesis, James Lovelock, decided to do a simple thought experiment to try and explain it to everybody. Scientists knew that over the time the Earth and life has existed, the output from the sun has changed quite a bit, but that Earth's surface temperature has stayed within certain boundaries. And this was a bit of a mystery. So Lovelock and another guy, Andrew Watson, made a model to check out whether it was at least possible that simple ecological changes could regulate a planet's surface temperature. So they imagined a world with black and white daisies. When the temperature dropped, this would favor black daisies, which absorb more light from the sun, warming them up and helping to increase the temperature. But when the temperature increased, this favored white daisies, which reflect more light back out, uh, keeping them cool and helping to cool the planet down, similar to what clouds do on planet Earth, a kind of planetary scale homeostasis. So this is one of those negative feedbacks where a system responds to a change in such a way that it returns itself back to its original balance. So Watson and Lovelock simulated this imaginary world a bit like a computer game. And sure enough, the results showed that the temperature of Daisy World, just as a result of changes in the abundance of black and white daisies, would remain fairly constant over great big changes in the sun's output. So that was great, and it really helped to make the hypothesis easier to understand and more widely accepted. Even though it wasn't really definitive proof, it was more like proof of concept. And things have developed a bit from there, as more and more examples of natural feedback mechanisms have emerged. So let's have a quick look at how systems like this are thought to work, because that tells us something quite deep about where our understanding has got to. Although these negative feedbacks help to stabilize the environment and all the life happening in it, that doesn't mean that change and evolution just grind to a halt. And this is because 
all these different interdependent components of the environment, the chemistry and physics and the complicated ecology and clever adaptations that emerge in it, are all extremely dynamic. That oxygen in the atmosphere, for example, is produced and consumed like the clappers. And this is true for all the other stuff going on as well. The carbon dioxide, the chemistry in the water, the ecosystems and species and all the individual creatures living in them. So while a system like this might be stable, it isn't just standing there doing nothing. It's bubbling away, whizzing around its cycles, reproducing itself over and over again, just like a gyroscope when it's spinning around. So when one bit changes, all the other whizzy bits are ready to respond super quick. Sometimes they compensate and correct for the change and reinstate the original dynamic equilibrium. That is, they use negative feedbacks like on Daisy World. But sometimes this whizziness unleashes another sort of feedback, a positive feedback that can make this highly dynamic system suddenly unstable. So it charges off in some brand new and unpredictable direction. A positive feedback is where a small change sets off a bigger change, which sets off an even bigger change and so on. And just like negative feedbacks, you can see these at work all over the place. When a plant first germinates, for example, it only has a few tiny leaves, so it can't photosynthesize and grow all that quickly. But as it grows more leaf area, it grows faster. So it produces more leaf area and then it grows even faster. Its growth accelerates as it gets bigger. So this is a positive feedback. But then after a while, the plant is big enough to start shading itself out. It's using up all the available useful light. So the light's not getting in anymore and the plant's growth slows right down. And eventually it's reached its maximum size. It's arrived at dynamic equilibrium. Still really, really active, but not changing anymore. So this is a negative feedback. These feedbacks and all the intense dynamics involved are fantastically useful adaptations for living systems, whether it's at the scale of a plant or an ecosystem or an entire planet. Systems like this live in a state of high dynamic tension, all squeezed together and interacting with each other. Negative feedbacks provide ninja-like poise and balance, while positive feedbacks provide ninja-like reflexes whenever conditions change. So this makes them very flexible and fluid, responding and adapting and able to make the most of really complex changing situations. It's as though they've managed to catch some wave and are surfing along, somehow more efficient than other ways of doing things. It's also thought that these super dynamic interconnected processes can set off complex echoes like harmonics or rhythms reverberating about and helping to generate lots of complexity at all sorts of other scales. Another obvious characteristic of living systems. So these are the sorts of mechanics that the Gaia hypothesis ultimately depends on. And part of its problem as a theory is that these mechanics are still a bit of a mystery to us. They're difficult to describe mathematically, difficult to make predictions about, difficult to experiment on. But it's still a really useful way of looking at things from a systems point of view especially if you're interested in how natural things work. These days, we're much more holistic and ecological in our thinking about the Earth and many other things too. Thanks to Lovelock, NASA now looks for life on other planets 
by looking for reactive gases in their atmospheres, which is a lot easier than actually having to go there. But it's also a way of looking at things that's really difficult to prove or disprove. And for some people, that's enough to dismiss it as bad science. So what do you think? Sometimes the Gaia hypothesis seems more like a question than an answer. But does that make it unscientific? So here are a few quite challenging follow up tasks. The first two are about how you might apply the Gaia hypothesis and to think about what it says about human systems or other systems you've come across in geography. The next one is to think about the kind of evidence that might support the Gaia hypothesis. And this last one is to think about the political dimensions of this idea. Is life all about competition? Choose one of them or make up one of your own if you prefer, but think about how you're going to explain your thinking to other people. For ideas like the Gaia hypothesis, finding a way to explain what you think is half the battle. Thanks for listening and see you next time.